Lee, Darren Smith, and Terrence Sudinich. You are right here. You are the one who stuck close for me. I'm so sorry. How far apart did I get on your name there, Terrence? Uh, six feet. Six feet. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. How are you both doing today? Good. We're doing well. We're actually standing in front of that very noisy fan, so I missed I missed the pronunciation. It was nice and cool. We it was all perfect, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I got the pronunciation exactly correct, right? Uh, you mean with the silent Z and the silent T? Yeah, I just skipped over the letters. That was okay. Yeah, that's okay. I just went straight to Terrence Hitch. <laughs> it's like it was easier and safer that way, I thought. <laughs> not really. A lot of people have had the Terrence Hitch and it's not safe. I, I, I've got a point for it, though, that I'm selling online for $19.99 a month. How much is the cure? Uh, there is no cure for the Terrence Hitch. As uh, these no people problem. know. What did I walk into here? <laughs> <laughs> you were standing by the fan, and you didn't hear it. I got you. Well, that's what happened. Uh, I want to. Uh, 21st century itch. <laughs> There's a cure for that. <laughs> uh, everyone uh, here obviously has seen Reef of the Genetic Opera. <laughs> I want to go all the way back to 2001. To where it is beginning in Black Box Theater. Correct? Yes. Okay. I'm making sure that I got the year right. Uh, I want to know when it was uh, first being formed, what was that inspiration? What was the one thing that was like, this is this is where this idea needs to go to? Well, wow, just start, start with an easy one, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, where does creativity come from? Exactly. Oh. Um, can, just, is this, is this, am I like booming or popping on this? Yeah. Like, I stand back, is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. From here, I'm hearing like, so I just stand here. No, that's all me. Well, we, we you know, it's funny enough, um, we can get into the inspiration of it, but just last night, I had dinner with um, someone that was part of the original stage production man named CJ, who lives up in Sacramento. And he traveled with us to New York. So to give you a brief overview of what happened with Repo, we started off doing it as kind of little skits in rock clubs, just the two of us. And then it grew into a fully staged first act, uh, which we staged at a theater in LA. And then uh, we took a year, based, wrote notes based on that, kind of did some rewriting, restaged it a couple years later in, in LA again and then got kicked off by an off-Broadway theater in 2005, where we took it. Uh, and I bring up CJ because he played music kind of throughout the entire journey of Repo. And he's one of, I don't know, 100 people, 200 people, 300 people that have touched this thing along the way. And I haven't seen him in almost 10 years. So last night we sat down and we kind of were just going down memory lane about the experience of making the music, recording the music and performing the music. And so I guess in a roundabout way of taking a long road to answer your question, I think what I'm most excited about looking in hindsight about the creation of this was that we were rebels the entire way. So when we started off, like Darren said, don't scream breaks, we were actually doing little things in coffee shops, including screaming breaks. So wrong venue, wrong song, and yet somehow rebellious in a way that gave the next step in the process fuel. Because it was a little bit of like 75% of the room not only didn't get it, didn't like it, were upset being yelled at graves while they're sipping a latte or something. But there was always a couple of people, and it was usually ones you never expect, they would come up and they'd be like, I don't like most things, but this somehow is my language. And, uh, and it's weird over the years to see how that's continued and people have come up to the table where we're out there already and it's like generation. Someone's with their kids and now they're in the repo. So I think when I look at it, it's been a rebel's journey of deconstructing musical theater in a way that we would like it and apparently you do too. Long with it.
Now, along the way in that journey, uh, the fans, like you said, the ones that got it, the ones that found it, gravitated towards, they're obviously in the room now. Uh, when I showed it the other night to somebody who had never seen nor heard it before, their first question out the gate was, oh, it's a horror musical, so it's Rocky Horror, right? <laughs> and I said, well, if that's what you're expecting, you might want to leave. Uh, they, they loved every single second of it, but the comparison to Rocky Horror continues. Somebody just in the hallway here also mentioned that same thing. And I said that as far as when you have something that you believe is uh, your art form that you love as a fan, and you passed it on to somebody else, very underground like Rocky back in the day, but very much for Repo. When I first heard of Repo, somebody handed me the soundtrack, actually, before I ever saw the movie. Actually, this person here handed me the soundtrack before even seeing the movie. So, what? how do both of you handle, A, that comparison, and B, is that even a comparison that you're, you're something that, I don't want that ever talked about, don't ever mention Rocky and Rocky. <laughs> No, I don't think so, speaking for myself. I think that we embraced it clearly. It's always hard if somebody's saying, what's your project about? You know, they want to type stuff, right? So we, what we were trying to sell this as a movie, we were doing an yes. elevator pitch, which was basically, well, picture this. It's Rocky Horror means Blade Runner. And we were just very happy, actually, that Rolling Stone magazine Ago, put up and said, here's the top 25 cult films of all time. And we're up there in between Rocky Horror and Blade Runner. So, you know, I speak for myself, I don't mind it at all. I do think that we knew from right off the, the, the start, when we did this as a 10 minute opera, that there were these repo heads, people just crazy about it. And we just, I think that it's easy to think of Rocky Horror in that sense and just how much people love it. That said, music's different, you know, it's a different time and whatever, but that, that's my response. You know, it's, it's funny, like, just to go back down the nostalgic answer, I guess, which is looking at, it's like even this, I think this is the first convention. I mean, we haven't sat next to each other on a panel in years, so. So it's it's like sometimes your answer from a few years ago is different now. And you sort of look at all of that, and as Darren said, I think when we were initially trying to get Repo just out there, you know, get it produced, get it recorded in a way that actually communicated what we wanted to sound like, and that's very difficult to do actually. You know, you have an idea in your head, and, and then you suddenly have all these people involved, actors, different singers, musicians, realities of budgets. But I think when you're starting, especially in Hollywood, which I think is just so important often, like you need the simple bullets for people to understand it. And, um, and while I think we embraced it at the time, um, and it is accurate, it's not, it's not inaccurate, because we do love both of those movies. But I think probably the part that is connected, it goes back to my first answer, is like, it's, it's, it's like a lane for rebels. So I think that there is overlap with Repo and Rocky and then it's music and there's horror. But I would say really what it is, it's just defying expectation and doing it boldly. Um, and in many ways, even in the areas where maybe we aimed high and missed the mark, at the time it might have bothered us, but now I think it's actually part of the charm because even the missing mark was done so with like artistic, or even if it was misguided perhaps at the time in places, you stand back and go, yeah, it was just an exercise in exuding and unusable exuberance in a way, but you know, it's just it's hard to explain, but I'm sure some a lot of your creators in this experience to say there's just something about having this kind of image in your mind, and which we both did, of what we were going to do. We knew the world we wanted to create. I don't think we really knew the story. I know when we did. 
did the first stage play, we just did the half of the first act. We didn't even have an ending yet. Um, but it's almost kind of like when you wake up from a dream and you can't, you have this feeling of something, but you can't put it into words. And I think for us, at least for me, that's what Reba was like. It, it just was, there was an element of something that we were trying to articulate. And luckily, I think, unlike a lot of other movies, we had the opportunity to get this in front of audiences. So by the time it came out as a film, there were thousands of people who probably seen it, at least hundreds. Um, and we got their notes. And they were like, ah, this doesn't work for me, and blah, blah, blah. And like Terrence is saying, sometimes it was like, I'm sorry it doesn't work for them, but this is kind of what we're going to do. Yeah. And we didn't really change that vision, I think, even during the film, no matter what kind of notes we got. Yeah. We were just like, okay, we're just going to do it our way. That rebellious spirit probably yeah. through no matter what your notes were. Yes. Yeah, and, and I don't think we were necessarily even thinking that that's what we were doing. We just liked what we liked. But when you kind of look at it in hindsight, you realize part of why we liked it is no one else was doing it. Like, it was almost too audacious. Like, what? We are going to dedicate that much time and resources to making a wacky, you know? And, and, and it was also just like, well, of course. Why aren't you? <laughs> why aren't you? <laughs> I'm curious that with that and that with, with that rebellious spirit looking back on hindsight, you mentioned the certain things didn't make the mark for you or possibly didn't hit the mark that you were looking for. Or do you have any examples of what you were really hoping to achieve with certain scenes or songs that you didn't quite get them? Well, I mean, I would you like to get that one? Well, yeah. Um. <laughs> I'm going to throw you under the bus. Is that okay? okay? <laughs> Here's what Terrence did not like. <laughs> <laughs> he won't tell you. <laughs> the ten things Terrence will not tell you. And now you know why they haven't been on a panel together. <laughs> <laughs> they won't be again. <laughs> um, I think, okay, two things. One, when I, I had to see the film for a while, either until I was at a Shadowcast in Maryland a few months ago. And it's kind of like Terrence is saying, yeah, the benefit of hindsight. It's kind of like, well, I kind of wanted this to be different. I kind of want the order of certain things to be there, and they weren't. Um, I think everything was kind of a, a beautiful, exquisite corpse, so, you know, a beautiful mess that was kind of born about the things that, in hindsight, I don't think I would have done. I don't think we would write a story from like the perspective of a teenage girl. You know, that can't be able to do, but I don't know. Neither one of you have a lot of experience being a teenage girl? I did at one time, but you know, that was the eighties. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's had that experience in the eighties, I understand. I, I do think that we um, we did take the hard road. We took the hard road because honestly, I don't think we felt like it was going to be worth it unless we did what we really wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, I agree with all of that. And, and I guess to answer more specifically, you know, as an artist, I think you're almost dissatisfied with everything the second it's completed. And um, so much so that. Like in my own life, I almost find difficulty with continuity between projects, even though that's sort of how I measure my life. You know, I, I was in this, doing this at this time, I was doing this at this time. Uh, and then I look back and I'm like, I have trouble even like placing it in years because it was almost like when it was done, it was almost too much to even look at. You know, it's like you see, you see something different. Um, and, then, and then in hindsight, you see something different again. It's sort of like this ongoing thing. But I think that, you know, I think one of the things I learned, and I don't know if there's any filmmakers or, or musicians or artists in the audience, but at least trying to tell stories with music. And I think this is one of the reasons why I said we're trying to like deconstruct musicals, for example. I think is one of the things I really don't like about musicals typically is they kind of tell you everything. You know, it's like literally, I feel this way, and they just say that, I feel this. And they're pretty. Oh, so pretty. And on yeah. some level, the music allows for that directness, and maybe that's why people often enjoy music here, because it is such a light of fancy. But I think we sort of wanted to make it 
trickier. I, I don't know, something like that. And so, with film being, I think, primarily a visual medium, and really, for all the Rico being a musical, there wasn't a whole lot of actual music we trained people on set. There were filmmakers who were kind of just excited to do this shiny thing that they didn't quite understand or rare opportunity. But it's this weird thing where it's like, I think as a songwriter, as an artist, I want everything to be sort of cool. I want it to be that there's, you think you get one message, but there's another one and another one, and maybe two or more happening at once. And I think lyrics support that. But when you're trying to tell a story, especially one that has some of these campy things, sometimes it it leans towards on the nose, or what I've found maybe the things I find most troubling after the fact is you write all these descriptions in the script, and even if it's on set, you think it's going to register, but the camera might just wipe past something, and we, didn't, we weren't in control of the game. You know, we were writing the music, and often being told, can we make the song shorter so that the vision can fit and move along quicker? And then when you look at it, you have all these ideas of like, okay, this poster will have this line that will reflect on something you're seeing, or this, that. And then you watch the movie, and none of that comes through. It's, it's shot, it's put together out of order, or this. And then in those moments, you're like, oh, we should have just said it. We should have just said what it was, had the characters sing it. So even if you see nothing, you understand that bit of thing. And so those moments trouble me after the fact, but I suspect if we did say it, it wouldn't be popular now because it'd be like too clean. And we'd be like, ugh, we shouldn't have just said it. <laughs> so I guess the point is you're never satisfied, and that was my Weasley way of answering the question. <laughs> I do think that we both, as much as we like musicals, I mean, we were bothered by that idea of saying, you know, oh, I feel it's a beautiful morning. And now you got to repeat the whole thing in song. So that's why most musicals hours long and more. Um, I felt like we wanted to get right off the bat, you knowing that this is going to be some, it's an opera from beginning to end, so that we don't, I find it jarring to go in and out of character from singing to speaking. Um, I think it was interesting when we were giving our script to Lionsgate and others, um, basically everything that would be capitalized in the script is sung. Um, everything that's in lower case is spoken. And people are like looking through it and like, I don't see any lower case things <laughs> here. And we're like, that's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's the word opera. Yes. <laughs> you mentioned uh, there about world building and I know that I read on a couple occasions that Rico was originally supposed to be middle part of a trilogy or the first part of a trilogy and unfortunately because of rights issues and Lionsgate that will not be happening. What is, what would that have looked like for a follow-up to a repo specifically? I think, I don't think that we wrote this specifically with a prequel or sequel. That was out in the fact that we just saw how people responded. Also, it's, it's, it's amazing, like, and, and of course, we and someone will ask for this by having this sort of to be continued comic book ending. But yeah, it was almost like immediately it was just being said as though that was true. Like, we, yeah, of course, we wrote up we wrote up another opera that precedes this and one after in all our spare time. <laughs> yeah. and, and everywhere you go, it's like just being said that way. And I think the other Darren just. You know, something he's like, oh yeah, it exists. <laughs> sure. and I think he just wanted it to be true. <laughs> that so it's a little bit more of an urban legend. It is. That being said, you know, Terrence and I started out right. We did write another musical together. Three, and yeah. Then, yeah, and we performed them in coffee houses. And then, like Terrence was saying, we did, I don't know, maybe nine, ten minute operas. And we go through a whole gamut of things from Rebo to him being coming out with a powder and wigs and doing, you know, 19th century Vienna or whatever. <laughs> they were all over the place. And but I think that it really was Rebo that resonated actually the back then called Necklin Rich's Day. That really resonated with people, I think, from 
there we decided, I think we can do it. I think we can at least put this on as a stage. Now you mentioned that it's uh, an urban legend that somehow just kept, the game of telephone basically just kept getting pushed down. I have three quick uh, myths about Repo that I would like to hear if these are fact or crap. Just, just tell me if, if this has all been made up and people are, just should shut up. And those are only two choices. Those are really your only, <laughs> unless you can tell me there's something where in between. Uh, if it's okay. half fact, let me know. Uh, Paul Servino refused to spit up blood because of his own father's death. <laughs> wow. Uh, shit, that was the, that was the yeah, that was factor shit. Yeah, shit, but wow, pretty creative too. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, how about there was a planned George Romero cameo? <laughs> <laughs> My goal is with this whole panel is just to stop people from repeating these things. Well, you I, didn't, I didn't even know shit. that was a thing. Yeah, I think that's shit. The <laughs> wonderful. Okay. I think it was taken out of context. Uh, we did not do it for George Romero. Like, yeah. George Romero is not that. We won't it. No, that you like George Romero. He just wasn't ever planned. Wonderful. <laughs> Last one. And this one I've heard more than once. Uh, that. In order to raise the last fifty thousand dollars needed, Paris Hilton did a DJ gig at a club. There's <laughs> <laughs> kind of truth to that. And there's kind of truth. Oh yeah. I mean, I think actually the numbers were we were. I want to say like we were a hundred grand short. Um, that's when we started. <laughs> but I want to say hockey, which we say go, but we included this uh, champagne in a can that, that, uh, that Paris was hawking, right? And then we ended up getting our extra money, and all we needed to do in the show again. So, that's not true. That, okay. That, that's an absolute element of truth. Wonderful. So everybody can stop talking about the trilogy, people can stop talking about Paul Servino, they can stop talking about George Romero, but Paris held the kind of right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I can't say anything. What well, this just big. People obviously have said just about it. Uh, I want to know, uh, Darren, personally, before I start opening up to uh, Q&A, Darren, was it Repo that got you to write a song for Eurovision Song Competition? Or did you already write that before Repo? <laughs> He's looking at me like... <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> Before Rebo was in a group called Atla San Diego. I love that rumor or whatever you're spouting, but no, I, I'll take credit for it. There is, there is a song out there that you can find that is credited to your name that is a French title. Ireland du Point. Anyone? Perfect. Uh, it was a competition 2008 for <laughs> Ireland in the Eurovision Song Competition, and it's obviously a different Darren Smith, but somewhere along the line, they have connected it saying it was the same Darren Smith who <laughs> co wrote Repo. Wow. Uh, yeah? And all my extra time, though, were doing it, Yeah. You know, that one day I wasn't on set. <laughs> That's what you were doing? You were yeah, writing a yeah. song for Eurovision? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, let's open it up. I know I, uh, we have a lot of Repo fans. My goodness, you guys have doubled while I was talking. <laughs> That's terrific. Either that or you were really busy over here. Uh, let me see. Who's got a question for either Darren or Terrence? Oh my god, way in the back! No, now? I call you out and there's a no. Come on, right over here. Not, not so much a question, but just a comment going back to... Uh, a, the connection to uh, Rocky Horror, and uh, yeah. there was another part. But basically, uh, here in town is a Rocky Horror shadow cast Amber Sweets. They also re they also shadow cast Repo, and because they switch off between the two of them, the entire cast shares a head cannon that connects 
the world of Repo to the world of Rocky Horror. Basically, the, the planet universe. of Transsexual and the galaxy of Transylvania is the world where Repo happened. That's why it's always nighttime there. <laughs> and uh, Frank is, it, this is known as the son of the Queen of Transylvania, who in their, in their minds is uh, Roddy's daughter, who took over uh, Gene Corp, and now she's the queen of their world, sent her son to Earth to try to find a cure for their addiction to Psydrate, but he got sidetracked making Rocky. <laughs> I love that and, so and, dri and driving Ritz and uh, Rip Rap insane in the meantime. So that's why Revenge of the Old Queen is the sequel to the actual sequel to we don't talk Rocky. About and, and this is their headcanon. This is only them, but thank you, Amber Sweets, for trying to put these two the crazy things together. Wow, well, the answer is yes. <laughs> And we wrote the sequel called It's Called Succession. But I, right. but I didn't know it until I showed up with to have his French song translated. Yeah. <laughs> and, That's uh, when you found out. And I was like, you son of a bitch, you've been holding out on me again. <laughs> I like to say, everybody, would you have a GoFundMe account? Because it's like, I'm trying to get a translation here. <laughs> right up here. Yeah, so I was always wondering, for both of you, what's kind of one of the coolest fan interactions you've had as far as all the years of doing this? Coolest fan interaction? Oh, yeah, yes. No, coolest. Yeah, coolest. Standing in front of the fan. <laughs> or, or, or strangest, if you want to get the strangest, too. I think some of the, I mean, I'm not sure if I can go with this one, but I do know some of the coolest things have just been the intricateness of the props people build and, and how much money they spend out of their own pocket to, to make just about anything. And I think Terrence has somebody with a, a tattoo on her back of the great huh. robber. Oh, awesome. Boyfriend kind of objected to that. <laughs> But I think odd to look down to. <laughs> I heard this today too. That so it's, it, it does it, it it always humbles me and you know really makes me happy when I hear people say I grew up with this. I was young and, and this was a formative thing for me. Or this is the most important thing that they ever watched. Um, so I, I I don't know if I can pick out one thing, but I do know that there's a family. There's a family out there, several thousand people that were in some ways connected to and friends with, all because it started with this little German idea and us sitting around in coffee houses in LA trying to write this stuff. So I, I, I really think that's something I'm proud of, I think we're both be proud of, but also something that, that is that's really difficult to answer a question like that. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, it's it's surreal. I mean, I know we've been here since 11:30 this morning, and I can honestly say I've had several experiences already that probably could fit in a hat. That actually embody maybe what what stands out the most. And I think, you know, as artists, I'm just speaking for myself, I'm insecure about everything. You know what I mean? It's never good enough. Like I said, the second it's done, it's sort of like, I'm almost afraid to look at it in some kind of way. So it's, it's there, and even if I can be proud of it simultaneously, I can almost feel like it's either not good enough or it's not mine in some weird way. And so when, when strangers or even people that I've seen over the years and now know and consider friends, um, at some level they bring like a level of reality to this journey. It's hard to reckon on your own. And so maybe to make it specific, um, someone came to the table this morning, some. And while that is an extreme reaction to have, with somebody, an extreme experience to have with somebody that you just are meeting 
Um, and of course, some of it is just the awkward. I mean, hell, we walked in here, I think it took us 10 minutes to even find the cadence for which to speak. And so you have that with new people, and they have to, they have to, they have to jump on us. They know more about us than we do about them, right? And even if it's just this work we created. And now someone's crying in emotion, right? And there is a version of that that's too much. You know, it's like, I, it's too much responsibility. I don't want to break down, you know, because if I start, I'm not going to stop. And this whole day is going to be But I think it's sort of like, I think what it does for me is I have trouble recognizing my own work. But I don't have trouble recognizing the work that I love. And sometimes that work, you know, you watch it and you're just like, oh my God, this, this is getting me. Like, I feel it. I'm crying over a song that touched me or a performance or just something that reminded me of something in my life that whatever it is. So it all feels maybe like make believe, like we're living in this alternate reality, except for in those moments. And I kind of go, I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be in love with something irrational. Um, so much so that you break down from a stranger when you just want to say thank you. And so, I mean, I'm emotionally talking about it. You know, you stand there and you go, oh, that's what I wanted. That's what I set out to do. Maybe you couldn't have put it into words, but it was to connect. It was to have something, some family, some surrogate experience. And then when it happens, it's like, too much in some ways. But then you lean back and go, that's what it's all about. And there are variations of good, bad, and ugly on that spectrum. And I could share stories about all of them. But generally speaking, that's the perspective that's coming through. And it's like one of mutual overwhelming, I think. And, um, and so there's no language there that even can bring it together. But I'm just like, if the work we did elicits that response from some people some of the time, then fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Before I ask another question, is there an example of a type of work for either one of you that is emotion that has elicited that same type of emotional response for you? <laughs> Can I, uh, may I okay. So just to be embarrassing, so, um, did you guys all know who Shawnee Smith is? Yeah. yeah. She's out there right now. Yeah. And she was in one of the parts of the Rebo journey that we left off was we made a short film before uh, it became a film. And that was after being staged in New York. And Shawnee Smith played Amber Sweet in the short film. So we haven't seen her since then. I mean, it's been oh, wow. 16 years. Oh, wow. years. Yeah. But very recently, uh, my girlfriend and I watched Annie from uh, 1982, 82, something like that. And I've seen it when I was younger. But watching it now as an adult, kind of like the things I was talking about, it's just new, it's different. And I go, oh man, I, I like this better than a lot of stuff that's done now. But Shawnee Smith was, uh, was one of the girls in it. Uh, and I found that out. And um, so I went over to her table and I said, I haven't seen you in a while, we hugged each other. I said, just watch any. Uh, and he touched me. And I cried here, which I was not expecting, right? Because it's such a sweet, it's like, it is the anti reaper <laughs> this is my new form of rebellion. But I'm like, oh, she has a daddy now. <laughs> and so, and, uh, and Shawnee Smith did the little bit of dance move with the towel, just when I told her. That I like so I know I'm probably setting her up for like all day now. You're oh, gonna no. But it was worth it. <laughs> I think that um, because of the fact that we did very few changes that other people wanted us to do, in other words, we stayed so close to our original vision, that creates a more of a feeling naked, you know, feeling vulnerable because you know, if I'm doing something that's work for hire or not really, they just hire me to do music or whatever, I don't have that much emotional invest in the I'm putting myself out there in repo as this is something I thought was important that that, and, and we wanted to not just be cynical, funny, ha ha throughout the, the opera that we really did want those emotional moments in between hearts being repossessed. 
Um, so when people do say that they cry during, uh, for example, I didn't know I love you so much. Yes. Yes. I really, which by the way, the, the impetus came originally was my son. He was two years old, or one year old, I don't remember. But I was like holding him and that song came to me. Idea and of course, parents help take it from there. But we really, I think, to try to bridge a gap between something that is over the top and heroic and, and all that with something that can really strike me personally, a chord of emotion, but then strip of any snark or irony or whatever. I think that's kind of, for me, the beauty of this project. Right here. I, I actually do have a question that's from the uh, rumor mill. Uh, you know, is this true or is this crap? How much of Repo was inspired by the Repo scene in Meaning of Life, Monty Python? Because there is a Repo scene in that film uh, that yeah. leads into the universe. So when they're taking out the dead, right? Is that the like yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. Not, not, uh, not bring out your dead. In Meaning of Life, there's this lady, and she's sitting at home, and all of a sudden the repo men come, and they start repossessing her husband's organs. And uh, the guy in charge of the two repo men can take her aside, and he sings her this song about, you know, how vast the universe is. And, you know, what's happening right here to your husband? It's kind of meaningless compared to everything. <laughs> Wow. But, well, you know, you know I'm, I'm I've just heard people bring it up. Um, you know, it's, it's well, when you do something, you, you learn immediately. Like, people come up like, oh, you know, your song sounds kind of like this song. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. You know, okay, and then okay. sometimes I'm like, I, I get really self conscious when I listen to the song. I'm like, it sounds nothing like this song. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so actually, I've never even seen the scene. Okay. So, um, maybe, maybe we should, but. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah it's, you know, it's. But that's wild. It's one of the funniest things. It's gory, it's hilarious. It was an homage to them. Okay, you know, the scene is gory, it's hilarious, and the song is catchy, so you yeah. know. Manos? Uh, I have a plethora of questions, but I guess I have to stick to one. Recently, I actually discovered one of the 10 minute offers on YouTube. Well, yeah, you have to listen to it through a certain medium to actually hear it, but whatever happened to the short film? We can't release it. The right we can't do. Which, by the way, almost on a monthly basis for the past like, 15, 16 years, I get somebody get in touch with me and say, We want to be the theatrical rights. We want to do this as a musical. And that's my biggest regret, actually. We can't do that without getting the okay. And uh, I don't know when we'll get the okay or, or what, but I would really like to be able to travel around the world and, and listen to the things that are musical. The closest we get is the shadow cast. And I will say like the last shadow cast I went to, the sound was so way down that they were actually acting it all out. So oh, wow. Yeah, so it was, it was really <coughs> beautiful. And uh, you know, they, they were kids, and, but it was cute to see them do it. Kids, I mean, like, they let me do it. Um, and one of them sang through the song. And ends with gold, and she ran that thing out for God knows I don't know. I, I, I want to say two minutes, but it was yeah. wow. Time. Everybody got up and applauded. We're like, where did that come from? And she's like, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, we have time for I believe uh, one or two more questions. Let's go purple hair in the back. No, not specifically. Um, sort of a weird bit of story. Bill Mosley actually came and saw the Repo stage play uh, okay. before we knew him uh, in LA. We were doing it in a small theater, and then a few years later, I think mostly the director was a fan of his work. And you know, you act, you ask actors, can you sing? Yeah, sure. And you know, are you a sharpshooter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Are you in a murder? Yeah. Yeah. yeah! Did you write this Eurovision 3000? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We, 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 
<laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Let's go Freddie right here. So you guys put together such an amazing cast for this film. I'm curious, is there any particular actors that you guys collaborated and worked with on Repo that you had especially good time working with or have a funny story of? I mean, like, I'm a huge Anthony and Stewart fan, but like, Ash, yeah. you guys put together an amazing cast for that movie. Well, I, I love working with everybody. Uh, probably the one that touched me the most might be Sarah Brinkman. Um, yeah. And not the least of which, she came in while we were starting rehearsals because we had another person who played that role and had to drop out. The schedule was not play. So she just like she just flew on a plane. She was in Russia. I flew on a plane, not even really knowing what this. Another one that was not in the in the repo, and sadly it worked out because we love uh, Anthony Head. By the way, he's such a great villain is he is uh, uh, in Ned. What is it? Ned Lasso. Thank you. And, and, but um, before that, we were working with Patrick Swayze. Oh, 